Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Kenichi, and welcome to another edition of Valley Sports Rewind. I am very excited today. He was a former Ansonia quarterback from 1962 to 1964. He was also an assistant coach with Ansonia from 1972 to 1999. And he was also the former mayor of Ansonia from 2000 to 2014, the great Jim Del Volpe. And Coach, I want to thank you for coming on today. Mike, thanks for inviting me and looking forward to it. Coach, let me ask you, um, let's start right off the bat. Where did a love for Ansonia football begin for you? Uh, when I was a kid growing up, uh, you know, I lived on the west side of town, and I used to go up to Nolan Field. That used to be our hangout, and uh, used to watch all the older kids play, and uh, I became very interested and excited, and hopefully that I was going to play one day, and uh, fortunately I did, and uh, I was very happy that I did do that. Right, and if I'm not mistaken, there wasn't Pop Warner back then, correct? No, there wasn't. It was just a uh, schoolyard or, you know, out in the streets, you know, go to right. the field, get a bunch of guys, and start playing. You know, we used to draw up plays, uh, or we play in the streets, you know, and, uh, you know, a car would be out of bounds, and, you know, right. uh, a bush would be a touchdown, a tree would be, you know, a goalpost, things like right. that. And how, um, back then, I, you know, Ansonia had success, you know, they would obviously go on to even greater success, but how was the program back then when you were a kid, like, say, 10, 11 years old? It was very intense, even back then. I remember uh, how uh, uh, practices, I used to go up and watch practice. I used to watch them play games. Uh, I, I felt infatuated with Coach Jarvis, uh, right. the way he handled the, the young, he used to call them young boys, uh, that used to play for him. And, uh, you know, I was looking forward to doing that one day. And uh, like I said, I was very fortunate that I was able to do that. Right. So now I I believe, like I said, you played from 62 to 64, did they have freshman football your first year at Ansonia? Yeah, they did. As a matter of fact, we were undefeated uh, oh, our wow. freshman year. And uh, that brought a lot of optimism for Coach Jarvis. I think previously he only had one undefeated team. He coached from uh, 1938 to 1966. Right. And uh, he had one undefeated team and one untied team. I mean, one tied. He had two undefeated teams. One was tied. Right. One was undefeated. And uh, as freshmen, we were undefeated, and we were looking forward to um, uh, playing varsity. I was. Uh, uh, I was remember when I was a freshman. Frank Oshesky was the quarterback. Oh, okay. And yeah. what did you play as a freshman? I was a quarterback. Oh, but so did but you? I didn't him play split I, time no, or no? Just freshman was, football. That was it. Right. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this: Who was your first coach? Who was the freshman coach that year? Uh, Michael Redadante. Okay. You know, who's a former mayor of Ansoni also. Right. Yep, he was our freshman coach, and uh, uh, Coach Jarvis and uh, Coach Dave Wright, and then there was uh, Frank Alu were the varsity right. coaches. You know, I, I'm glad you brought up Alu. You know, he would go on to coach at Derby, but he was an Ansoni graduate. He coached the Ansoni many years. Let me ask you, I know when I had him, he was he could be rough sometimes. Was he a rough coach when you played for him? Or he was. No nonsense? He was, but he was very enjoyable to play for. I mean, right. you know, he knew how to handle the kids. Uh, he was very knowledgeable about the game. Uh, as a matter of fact, my brother-in-law sees him quite a bit down Florida now, so you know we keep right. in touch that way. He's doing well, but uh, yeah, he 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 loved the Ansonia. You know, it's right. unfortunate that he you know he had to leave, him, but he went to Derby, which is in a bad place to go to. Right <laughs> now, you had a great friendship with Jack Hunt over the years, and I believe you two also played together. Correct? correct. Jack was on the team. Um, Jack, were you guys friends as far as going back to when you were younger and stuff? Yeah, Jack and I grew up together on the West Side. Uh, Jack was a year ahead of me. Um, he was a senior when I was a junior. He was the captain, and uh, per- that was perhaps the biggest high school team I've ever seen, uh, right? Size wise. They had uh, Jack, he was 6'7", 330. They had John Ennis, right. 6'5". Uh, they had uh, Joe Majora, 6'4". Eddie Cook, who was 6'3". I think the smallest kid in the line was Mark Kordash, and he was like 6'2". Right. Uh, unfortunately, we only went 6-3 and three that year, and we lost... Well, you know, as we lost our Valley rival Derby, which I think was one of the best high school games I played in. Right. So now let's talk about your sophomore year. Um, how would you say that went? And did you did you have a good feeling that you could be the quarterback down the road for this program? No, as a matter of fact, my sophomore year, uh, I didn't go out for the team. Oh, really? No, I concentrated on basketball and baseball. Right. Uh, I went out for spring, and then I went out early fall, and I said, I want to play basketball. Coach Jarvis didn't have a problem with that. 
Um, right. So I didn't play my sophomore year. Then just before the junior, my junior year, uh, myself and Bobby Edmonds showed up up at the field, and we said we'd like to, you know, rejoin the team. And Coach Jarvis said, uh, "No problem. He'd love to have us." And uh, we played Wilbur Cross that day. They were the defending state champs, right? And we upset them twelve six. Oh, okay. Wow. So you know that was the start of my varsity career. Right now, let me ask you. Um, quarterback's a great position because you know you do get a lot of glory, but a lot of people I talk to over the years have said, you know, the one thing they never liked about it is it's a lot of pressure. Did you feel that when you played? Like, did you feel like, did you enjoy playing quarterback or did the pressure sometimes get to you? No, I, I really enjoyed playing quarterback. Right. I liked uh, uh, being in, not in control, but knowing what everybody was doing. Uh, back then, there was, there was unlimited, there's, there wasn't substitutions like you have today. Right. You can only substitute X amount of players during the, um, uh, the quarter. So and basically it was like a six-two defense, and so you basically knew what they were going to run against you. And we had about fifteen, twenty plays that I knew that we could run, and that's what we did. But it was a lot of fun, right? So let's talk about the Derby and Sony rivalry. Now you said Jack was a year ahead of you, so right. I believe you played on the '65 team, right? Right. That finally ended that long losing streak against Derby yeah. up at Jarvis Field. Yeah, that was talk, nice. talk about that game a little bit. You know, Jack. You know, before he passed, he gave me a lot of games, and I love watching that 65 game. That was a great game. Just talk about what, you know, how good that was to finally get over that hump. Well, it was, I mean, first of all, you had a great crowd. There was like eight to 10,000 people right. there. Everybody was really, it was a high pitch uh, game. We were undefeated. As a matter of fact, Coach Jarvis gave us the week off. He made the schedule so that we would have a week off before Derby because he hadn't beaten them in several years. Right. And uh, the year before, we lost, <coughs> like I said, which I think is one of the best high school games I've played in, 30-26 uh, to 26 to Derby. And I knew they had Tony Pazander and yeah. George Busniak coming back. They had the two Lungarini brothers. They had Dave right. Stockmull. I mean, they had kids that were mean that were, you know, I mean, they hit you today. Uh, you know, you, you really felt it. And I, I knew we were in for a battle, and we were. It was a very right. physical game. Um, it wasn't a wide-open game. It was like, here we come and here they come. And, uh, you know, we prevailed, which was uh, very emotional for us because we hadn't beaten them in 10 years. Right. And, you know, the crowd went crazy that day. You know, it's funny. A lot of people, you know, as you get to the 90s and stuff, they kind of – you know, neglect that that rivalry was big back then. They kind of think it just got big in the 70s, which wasn't true. I mean, it was big in the 50s. It was big in the 60s. But if you look at that crowd, like you said, I mean, people went nuts that day. You're right. I, and I remember being a kid in, uh, in the, the 50s going up to the high school. I know Derby beat us or 6 nothing or 6 It was a 6-6 six, six tie. And I said, you know, everybody was all upset because it was Derby. And I started to understand the reasoning behind it. And, you know, a lot of the, 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 the intensity came from the factories being in town. Right, you know, Ferrell's, both Yeah, yeah. Ferrell's, Ansonia Copper and Brass. Right. You had uh, people whose, you know, parents, their kids playing, working together, you know, big competition. Uh, my biggest, my, my dad worked at Uni Royal in Naugatuck. So my biggest opponent, according to him, had to be Naugatuck. Right. But uh, believe me, I understood how, what the Derby game meant. And... Uh, we, uh, you know, we beat them fourteen to eight. Yeah. Um, I took a safety late in the game, and I know I think it was Dave Stockmore or somebody planted me into the fence. Oh. I ended up going to the hospital, so I didn't get to uh, ce uh, celebrate uh, at the end of the game. But and there were no sure. cell phones, so you, no, you weren't we, even sure if you won the game. Exactly. <laughs> right. But uh, you know, I got to get celebrate later on, which was a great feeling. Right, and you know that rivalry was so much fun, and you know it's a shame it's not the same as it once was, but. You know, when I would talk to Jack, Jack was very successful as a coach against Derby. You know, I think he went like 13 and 4 against them, but he always would say to me, you know, I hated them forever because when I played, I did not beat them often. So, I mean, it was definitely a great rivalry for both towns. Oh, I, believe me, I remember the last play of the game in uh, 64. Uh, we was, we were, whoever had the ball last was going to win because the final score was 30 to 26. We had the ball last. It was fourth and in inches. I remember going to coach. We called timeout. I went to Coach Jarvis. I said, I want to run a naked quarterback bootleg. And he says, no, we're running over Big Hunt. <laughs> well, we got him up to the line of scrimmage, and I look across the line. There's Charlie Desenzo, yeah. John Cerny, 
uh, Stockmull, a uh, few other kids. And I'm saying, this is, I don't know how Rocky Sineski is going to do it. So he gave the ball to Rocky, and we, f- we felt those. He got the few inches, but uh, they didn't give it to us. And right. I know how Jack felt. And uh, Boots always told us, he says, no matter what you do, you have a successful year if you beat Shelton Derby and Naugatuck. And Naugatuck. Right. So those three games really meant something to us, and we took it seriously. Right. Now, you talked about how you concentrated on basketball and baseball, and you were a very good basketball player. Now, Mm -hmm. did you play? I know you played for Boots, but did you also play for McQueenie? Was he there yet by the time you were a senior? Yeah, I was there for McQueenie's first year. Right. Um, We made the tournament. Uh, I remember going down. We played at Southern Connecticut State uh, College. We played Lyman Hall, and uh, we got got eliminated by them, and I think it was the second round. Right. But, uh, yeah, Tom, was it was his first year, and, um, you know, he was learning. He was right. like anything. I was usually a young kid out of college, and he just started teaching and started coaching. Um, but it, it was enjoyable playing for Coach McQueenie. Right. And um, I know you're well-recognized for football, but um, was there a sport you liked better than the other? I mean, did you like baseball just as much as football? I, I liked all three. I, I think right. I, I liked basketball the best. As a matter of fact, I went to uh, – Cheshire Academy, right? Uh, to play there, and then I went down to Old Dominion College and played right. down there for a couple of years. And I transferred to Central. Uh, I didn't get to finish out my career up there. Um, I broke my ankle after I had a tryout, and uh, that was it uh, as far as playing. But uh, I enjoyed basketball, and that's how I became friends with uh, John Sponheimer. Him and I played uh, right. for the Norwoods uh, way back when, and I met John through uh, some neighborhood friends. He went to Notre Dame. Right, and you he know, grew up in Derby as yeah. a kid as well, yeah. As a matter of fact, I always kidded Jack uh, when we played Notre Dame. I think Spoonie had a double-double. He had 31 points and 30 rebounds. Wow. And Jack, <laughs> Jack had eight and six. So, you know, I always busted him off on Jack on that. So Right. Now, before we get into your uh, coaching career, one of the things that was interesting was when Coach Jarvis fu- did retire, uh, Ansonia took Ron Carbone. He had been coaching at Derby, and they took him for that one year. You were probably in college, so you couldn't pay attention as much, but do you remember anything about that one year he coached, and did you think he'd be around for a while? Well, I, I knew who Coach Carbone was. He was at Derby when we played him. Right. Um, you know, I, I thought he'd be there a lot longer than what he was. Um, you know, we were surprised by the move. We we always thought that Coach Allo was going to get right. it. Right. And we were kind of upset that he didn't get it. And, uh, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons or main reason why he went to Derby because right. he didn't uh, get the job at Ansonia. So, yeah, we're, I was surprised. Right. And now, did you – I mean, you probably saw him play as a kid, but did you have an idea who Coach McAllister was when he left Derby for Ansonia? I, I knew who Coach McAllister was. Uh, you know, he was a very tough uh, – um, he was a very tough person. And, uh, you know, I didn't know – you know, he was there the first few years. We we refer to him as the Lisi years, right? Because you know they were two and seven and two right. and seven. Uh, but uh, you know, I was very happy to join the staff. You know, I was looking forward to it. And what was your was nineteen seventy two your first year? Yeah, it was seventy two. Yeah. And ja- and I believe Jack had come one year prior, right? Jack was there first, then Spoonie came. Right. Uh, Spoonie, you know. Talk to Coach McAllister to get me to, to get on the staff. He, you know, him being a lawyer, you know how he gets. He, he right. he's got to be very long winded about things, and uh, he talked uh, to Coach McAllister to get me on the staff, and he, he did. And Bubba Green, uh, Will Screen, who was at um, ran the Kale Club right. at the time, was on the board of Ed. So uh, they gave me an opportunity. I started at the freshman level, and halfway through the year, somebody left on the varsity level, so I I moved up. And then Bobby Lisi, who was a good friend of my brother's, asked me if he could get on the staff. And I said, I'd talk to Coach McAllister. And Coach Mack said, yeah, definitely. Right. So let me ask you, what would you say the first couple of years were like there? Um, were you intimidated by Coach McAllister? I mean, like you said, he was a no-nonsense guy. And you're a young kid. Were you intimidated? De- definitely. I mean, there, yeah. there was no doubt about it. It was all seriousness. I know uh, Jack and I, we played a lot of softball. Right. Uh, with Cavsden, and um, we always used to play after Labor Day. And Coach Max said, That's got to end. And you know, I looked at Jack, and Jack looked at me. He said, Okay. Right. Because you know, he was serious about it. You know, he says, It's football, or, you know, don't bother coming. Right. So we, we made our decision, which was a great decision. Right. You know, I had him on uh, the TV show not too long ago, and he was so much fun to talk to. And he used to tell me that because you guys were so young and he was an older guy, 
he he didn't necessarily hang out with you guys as much but he would always like just kind of from afar watch you guys talk and stuff like that and he always kind of you know looked at it as these were like his sons i mean he really was like a father to a lot of you guys correct oh uh, yeah definitely i mean he, yeah we, he feared yeah we feared him jack john and i and bobby uh we feared uh, coach mack you know he was just the, that right. type of person but the, we had a lot of fun with him. I mean, he didn't even know how to pack a cooler back then. We had to teach him how to do that. <laughs> right. What um? When would you say into your coaching career you started getting involved more with the offense? Um, did Coach McAllister kind of take you under his wing with that? How did that come about? I, I, I think it started when Ozzie came, Sandy Olszewski. Right. Uh, the first couple of years uh, we had Roger Ings um, and a few other, I forget who else, uh, but when Sandy Oshesky came, and that's when uh, we said we got to open it up. We got we got to start throwing the ball. Right. You know, I, I kind of wish we had the kind of offenses they have nowadays. You know, with the oh, spread, because no. they'd still be talking about Ozzy, what, what kind of records he had. Right. I mean, he did that. I've never seen anybody be able to throw the ball like him. And you know, I, I talked to Coach Sponheimer about this, so let's talk a little bit about that '76 team. First time they ever implemented the playoffs, so that was new. But one of the things that you guys had not been able to do as coaches at that point was beat Derby. You really needed to get over that hump. I believe you beat them 6 nothing or 22-20 um, the first game. And you get over that hump. First off, talk about how relieved you were to win that game. But then on the other side of it, you have to play them in the playoffs again. That had to just be nerve-wracking as a coach. Oh, I mean, j- just going into Ryan Field back – you know, back in the 70s, it was unbelievable. You had Gino DeMauro coming down the hill on the horse. Yeah. You know, it was like uh, watching Florida State. They had the spear throw it in the middle of the field. Uh, you had the guys on the chains like Joe Daddio, Jerry Mascarella, Danny DeGennaro, who would be screaming at you while you are trying to call right. plays in and all that. You know, so it was very uh, intimidating factor. And then you had George Dunn, you know, who's a police officer. Right. He was supposed to control everybody on the sidelines. He never did. So that was just an intimidating place to play. Right. And we had him beating them, and you know, we feel we had, we felt we had the team to do it. And uh, we were in the game, uh, you know, the whole game. And I remember to play. Uh, I, I remember to play. I mean, it was a, a pass from uh, Sandy to Jeffrey Bruce. It was a uh, sl- right. we call it slot right uh, split end curl, and that's when the post does a flag and uh, the split end does a curl. And Sandy threw a rope. It must have went through three uh, Red Raiders and uh, right into Jeffrey's hand. He caught it. We won twenty two twenty, and God, we celebrated for a long time after that one. Right, and you know one thing Coach Sponheimer said was. The playoffs were new, so you really weren't thinking about the playoffs, and you weren't really thinking about Derby playing yeah. them again because it was so new. So you finally beat them, and you're celebrating. And what do you feel like when they tell you after Thanksgiving you got to play Derby next week? And now, you know, if you win, you beat them twice, and that's even better. But if you lose, it's almost like that regular season game they're not going to remember. <laughs> so how how stressful was that? I wish I could tell you how stressful it was. <laughs> I wish I could tell you what we said. Uh, but uh, it was it was brutal. I says, here we are. We finally beat them after 10 years, and uh, now we got to play them. And then we go to Kennedy Stadium, and it's freezing. and Right. You know, great crowd, and we got to do it again. You know, we didn't know if we could. Right. You know, we, we felt we could, but, you know, we said, Scott, you know, can we do it two games in a row in one season? Right. It was, just, it was yeah, it was extremely stressful. I remember we were practicing, and, you know, we, it's the end of the year. We had everything in. We're not going to change anything. And uh, it gets dark earlier. And uh, we used to pull cars onto the baseball field, turn the headlights on. Right. Start practicing. You know, keep practicing. Right. But we didn't run this right. We didn't run that right. You know, it's just, you know, we were, we were – doing a number on ourselves because we were so worried about derby again were you able to enjoy it or was it more relief no. when you guys won oh the second time when we oh yeah right. when we won definitely right yeah. so you were able to but you couldn't yeah. enjoy that whole week no. it was just and that, i mean that, that's the game where mac made the call uh we were in our own territory and he went for it on fourth and inches right if i don't know if you remember that Spoonie's on the headphones and he's yelling down to me, what's he doing? And he said, he's nuts. I said, yeah, I know he's nuts. I don't know what he's doing. He won't change his mind. And it was like fourth and one. And we went for it on our own, I think it was 23 or 22 yard line. And we got it. And right. we kept the clock running, which was, you know, which right. worked out to our benefit. You know, but he he took the risk and it worked. And that really started what would be like 
won the first of 20 championships, which yeah. is hard to believe. You know, let's talk about some of the great teams you coached. You know, I talked to this with Coach Sponheimer. A team that probably goes under the radar a lot because they had a couple losses is that 1988 team you guys had. You guys had lost a Monday afternoon game to Sacred Heart, and you had lost a game later in the season, the Derby, a 10-7 game. Um, I think a Kevin Sharkey touchdown got called back in that game. Yeah. But you guys rebounded. You won your last four, and you got to play New London in the playoff game. And if you remember, Ansonia fans were leaving. They thought the game was over. You guys were losing. I think it was 15-13. to 13, And Kevin Sharkey threw a pass to Dave D'Onofrio. He got popped as he threw it. You guys came back and won the game. Talk about that 88 team a little bit. Yeah, we had some good athletes. We had Dave D'Onofrio. We had Kevin Sharkey. Uh, Fran Hendricks. Fran Hendricks right. and all that. And my, my, my oldest son, Duncan, he was, he was a, a sophomore. sophomore yeah. 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 And I remember us having the ball late in the game. Um, we were marching, and um, uh, I, we ran this blue formation. It's, uh, it's an open formation. And Sharkey was quarterbacking because, I guess, Keith Pelotowski had gotten hurt or something. Right. He wasn't able to do it. And I, I called the uh, slot out and up. And that's Dave D'Onofrio where he'd run it out and then doing it up. And Kevin fell back and uh, dropped back, and he threw the ball. It was a beautiful spiral, and Dave was sprinting down the sidelines and right in his hands. And, you know, we scored. And then uh, we had to hold on because they had one more shot at it. But I, as, I, as I remember, they had their jackets on. Yeah, in London they had the state champion jackets made up, and they were up pulling them out and everything yeah. just before that play. And I think they but had a the, good back in Jamal Johnson. Jamal Johnson, right. yeah, yeah, and that, and you guys had to play them two years in a row. Yeah, and they were both nail biters. I mean, the '87 team, you guys won 28-27, so you kind of had a mini rivalry with them. Well, that first year we were had 28-7, we were cruising, and yeah. uh, you know I tried to go for the home run and try to uh, you know break the game open and. Uh, James Lane threw an interception, and Jamal picked it off and went like 80 yards for a touchdown, and it turned the whole game. And uh, But that was something, though. It was intense also. A lot of fights up in the stands because oh, yeah. they had the hill, and yeah. both, both, both uh, fans were on the same side. And uh, we had to go to the bus at halftime, and it was brutal. We couldn't even get to the bus. It was so bad. Right. Now, you were fortunate enough to coach on two number one rankings in the state, the 83 team and the 1989 team. It's hard to compare them. They were both great teams. The 89 team looked like that they, they cruised the entire year. I think Naugatuck battled them on Thanksgiving. It was 14-7. Yeah. to seven. But that team just coasted, you know, with Kevin Sharkey, uh, Dennis Tinney, you know, Bull, Kennebrew, you know, and obviously the offensive line, which was tremendous. And then that 83 team, and so many great athletes, Glenny Antrim, Johnny Lawler, I believe Earl Stanley. Yeah. Um, just talk about both those teams a little bit and how special they were. Well, I mean, 83 was very special because it was our first one. Right. Uh, you know, we had, we had some real good athletes there, and uh, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't blow everybody out. We had some close right. games, especially with Naugatuck. That was a barn burner. And Derby as and well. Derby, well. Yeah. That yeah. Derby was always barn burner back then, not right. nowadays, but back right. then, believe me, uh, Derby came to play all the time. And uh, the 89 team, they, they just, like you said, they went through everybody. There was right. hardly anybody that, you know. There wasn't uh, too too much competition that year, right? You know, and um, you know when you have somebody like Bull Kinnebrew in the backfield, where you just give him the ball and you, you're guaranteed five six yards every play, and you got Sharky who you you know just toss it to or Tinny toss right. it the other way, you know you, it was very simple back then, you know in '89, but '83 uh, was the more enjoyable one because that was the first one, right? And I mean, the, you talked about Naugatuck. those kids had not beaten Naugatuck. And they finally got over that hump on Thanksgiving, and you yeah. kind of knew when they got over that hump that they were going to just take this home. Yeah. Oh, no, that, that, that was a major win for us. We needed that really bad. Right. You know, one of the things I loved about Jack Hunt is he trusted his coaching staff so much. He really didn't have to call it defense. He didn't have to call it offense. He trusted you guys on offense. He trusted, you know, Bobby on defense. Yeah. He definitely would make input. But he would really just coach the team, and he let you guys kind of run the plays. Talk about how great it was coaching under him. Oh, it, it was unbelievable. I mean, I, I, a lot of our – everybody says, how would you put your offense together? I said, a lot of it came from TV. I was a big fan of Spurrier's when he right. was at Florida. And I would watch, and I'd grab some plays off TV, and then I'd go to see Jack. I said, Jack, here's what I want to run. He says, how do you block it? And bang, before you knew it, he had the blocking schemes down and everything else. 
But uh, let me tell you a good story. It was his first co- his first year. We're playing Shelton, and him and uh, Bob Riggio met at uh, midfield. And Riggio said, "No tiebreaker." You know, back then you, you, the coaches agreed on a tiebreaker. Right. And uh, so Jack said, "All right." He didn't say much. He didn't say he didn't say anything. You know, the guy said, "No tiebreaker." Right. So they're beating us the whole game. Seven, Seven nothing. nothing. Right. We drive. And we score with less than a minute to go. Right. Jack's about halfway across the field yelling at Coach Riggio, screaming, we don't play for ties here at uh, Jarvis Field. We don't play for ties. You know, we're not that type of team. No, no, no. And he looks at me and says, what do you got for a two-point play? <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> uh, pressure. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. If I remember to play, you know, I says, okay, uh, we, we put it together. We ran a wishbone, a rip-away crossing pattern. And James Lane was the quarterback, and uh, D'Onofrio went in motion, bang. We hit it for the two-pointer, we win 8-7. Right. That was a great you know? game. But yeah. that's the kind of guy Jack was. I mean, you know, Jack had that much confidence in us where he'd say, you know, here's the game on the line. He said, Dell, you know, go ahead, call your play. You've been working on it all week. Right. And, and, and he let us do it. But he was just – he was phenomenal at that. Um, and, you know, everybody said, what do you do, just roll the balls out? We didn't roll the balls out. We, we worked hard at what we did. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, I mean, you can't you know? win all those championships without – I mean, a bad year – I think a bad year for Ansonia that I would say was a bad year was 8-2, and two, and that's not a bad year. No. They – rarely ever lost more than two games and most of the time they lost one game in a season if they ever lost i mean program's been tremendous and the thing i love about it is bobby lisi was the head coach he had to step aside you know he had gotten a better position in the school and his time wasn't there yet he came back as an assistant and and he's still coaching to this day nobody had egos it didn't matter who the head coach was the head coach was more to just for the title, but you guys all considered yourselves coaches of this team. Well, we did. We all worked well together, and we all respected each other. Uh, the one thing I didn't agree with was back in the 80s when uh, Bobby had to leave because be- he became an administrator, right. was they hired uh, Doug Morell out of From Brantford. From Brantford, right. You know, I agreed to stay on the staff. I, I don't know if Jack did or not. Jack, I think, left to watch his son go play. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, because yeah. he was at Miami. Right. But uh, I said I'd stay, and... Um, you know, so we came back in the fall because Coach Morell said that he wasn't going to change anything. I says, "Listen, we got a good system going here. Uh, let's keep it that way." And he said he would. He comes back in the fall. We come back in the fall. He gives me a playbook, and I says, "I looked at it. So what's this?" He says, "Well, this is what we're going to do. It's all new plays, new terminology." Right. And I says, uh, I-, "I can't be a part of this. Sorry, Coach. You know, I'm out of here." Right. So you know, I left. I you know, Jack and I standing on the sidelines, Spoonie and Bobby. Uh, I think Bobby, Bobby was back. gone, right? Yeah. Well, Bobby, no, I think he came back to help Spoonie on the freshman level, right? And I think Earl Stanley and, and Earl Stanley, right? And uh, so Jack and I, uh, you know, we took the year off, and that was the only losing season they had since '72, uh, I think. Right, and you know, I yeah. I do think Coach Morell was a good coach, but I think he came into the system the wrong way. You. If it's not broken, don't fix it. And right. he tried to do – he didn't come into a program that needed to be turned around. He just came into a program that needed to keep going. And I think that was his downfall because he was successful at Brantford and Danbury, but he he came into the wrong approach. Yeah, he did. He, you know, he, all he had to do was keep it the same, and I, I think we would have been successful. Right. Talk about coach. You know, you mentioned your son, Duncan. You got to coach him, and his final year as a senior – they capped it off with the MVL championship against Naugatuck. I, I had heard at that point you had thought about leaving. You said you wanted to go out with him. You did come back for about 10 more years, but talk about what it was like to be able to coach your son. I mean, there it could be a positive and a negative. The negative is you, you got to probably be harder on him than most, but the positive is you get to see him you know, up close and watch him perform. Yeah, no, it's it's very difficult coaching your own son, especially at that level. Um, you know, because if you call a play and it's to you know it's, it's a pass pattern to him, everybody's saying, "Oh, he's trying to you know make him look good, or he's trying to right. single him out." But uh, Duncan was very he was a very solid player. Uh, his freshman year, he's a quarterback. His sophomore year, he's a tight end. Right. His junior and C, uh, junior and senior years, he was a tackle. Right. So you know we we didn't favor him at all. You know we we put him where we had. We had to use them. Right? right. And it was enjoyable, though, because I enjoyed going to the games with him, walking, you know, walking to the field uh, with him, uh, discussing the game afterwards. I think that's where he picked it up. 
so and also my younger son uh right and um uh what do you call it but he uh he had a good career, and uh, I'm glad he's into coaching. You know, he came to help us for uh, one or two years in Ansonia, right? Uh, after he went to, after he graduated from uh, school, and then uh, he went down to New Canaan. He was under Lou Marinelli for right. uh, ten years. Then an opportunity came for him to become a head coach down at Fairfield, Fairfield Ward. Ward, right? And he's been so, there ten years, I believe. Yeah, right? he's entering yeah. his tenth year, so. Yeah, and he's done a great job. Well, you know, good job down there is five and five, six and five. You know, I wish right. we could do a little better, but, um, you know, he's doing the best he can with what he has, you know, and he works at it. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Right. You know, and I, I enjoy going to watch him. You know, I, I get to go down there. I have a grandson, and we stand on the sidelines, and we, t- you know, we watch him uh, coach. Right. You know, coach, a couple of teams I want to bring up, you can't, you know, we can't do an interview without talking about these great Ansonia teams, the 94 and 95 Ansonia teams with Stephen Coughlin, Ronald Tate, um, Peter Reynolds. You know, I believe Luke Richmond was the quarterback. You know, that was another thing you guys were great about, too, is you knew Steve was a great quarterback, but you knew he could even help you more as a receiver. And you weren't afraid to move him from quarterback to receiver. But just talk about how great those two teams were, especially that 94 team. Well, they're they're very special. I mean, uh, you know, we uh, we played Bloomfield, I think, in the finals right. that year, and it was over uh, by the first quarter. Yeah, it was over by halftime. Yeah, and that, that's yeah. when we started to get our big rivalry with uh, Bloomfield. Right, right before the half, we were, uh, you know, we said we're going to score as much as we can, as quick as we can, as long as it's done in the first half. We'll right. do it with the first team. We won't embarrass anybody in the second half. Well, we, we ran a, a hook and ladder right before the end of the half. Right. And we scored a touchdown to go up like 42-14. And uh, that's when Cochran, Coach, you know, uh, Jack Cochran come running across and started screaming at Jack, and, you know, everybody got into it. Right. And, uh, you know, that's where our rivalry started with uh, Bloomfield. But that, that was a special group. I and mean, we had Luke Richmond at quarterback. I mean, right. Luke had a cannon. I mean, right. you know, it's obvious he went to UConn and played up there. And uh, with Stephen Coughlin, you could put Stephen anywhere. Which and, you put him at running back yeah. when Mike Barnabucci got hurt yeah. in that 95 game. Yeah, exactly. And, and we, we had to run the clock out. Or, you know, we needed a running back, and when Steven was the only one there, you know, and we put him in. He didn't fumble. He just kept uh, banging it in there for us. Right. But, uh, yeah, that was a special group, too. And that Naugatuck game, that was that, that was, was unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, they had the kid Edmonds. And that's a credit to those kids, and it's a credit to the coaching staff because – you guys are ahead 21-14, and Naugatuck ties it late. They've got all the momentum now, and yep. it's going in overtime. You guys didn't break. You bent a little bit, but you didn't break. And what a play at the end of the game with uh, Jay Jabina, you know, sacking oh, yeah. the quarterback. Yep, yeah, yeah, that was huge. But there, there, go back to you talk about Jack. I mean, we practiced all week a series of plays if it went into overtime. And Jack looked at us and said, run what you ran all week. Right. That's what we did. We went unbalanced one way, ran a play. Then we went unbalanced the other way and ran a toss to Ronnie Tate, and he went in for the touchdown. Right. You know, and uh, that's uh, that. That's where Jack was at his best. You know. Right. And then you know that '95 team. They didn't necessarily kill teams that year. No. You know that they beat Naugatuck seven nothing, beat Bloomfield seven nothing. But again, they knew how to win, and the coaches knew how to win. I mean, how was that season? Was that in, I mean, obviously you win a state title, it's enjoyable, but was that a tough season to get through as well? Yeah, it was. There's a lot there was a lot of pressure on us each year because, you know, it right. started it, it, it built to the point where god, if it's a close game, you're, you know, what's wrong with you guys? Right. You know, we had a win and uh the pressure was on the kids, but they they handled it well. They handled it well. And uh I remember playing Nagatuck, we started the game first series Luke hit uh, Steven on a slant. We go ahead 7 nothing. We saw this is going to be a laugher, and that was the final right. score. You and know, that wasn't we the best Naugatuck team either. No, it wasn't. Uh, you know, we, we figured that would be it, you know. and uh, We had a struggle, and then we struggled all year. Right. You know, it, was, it was a tough year. But we had to uh, impress upon the kids that we had a win. Just listen to what we're saying, right? and, you know, we'll get you over the hump. And, and that's what happened. You know, one of the things you guys weren't afraid to do either, I saw this with Ansonia probably more than any team, is you guys were not afraid to play young kids. If you felt like they could help you, they were on that field. And I believe there was a kid on that team that was a sophomore, uh, was it Cortez Johnson, I believe? Yeah. Right. You know, you implemented him as a sophomore. You had him out there playing. You guys have done that 
so many times over the years. I think Jeff Gregorio started as a sophomore. You know, Jason and Lightham, Jimmy Frolish. I mean, you guys always, yeah. you weren't afraid to put these kids out there if you knew they could help no, you. even Jeffrey Coppola is a sophomore. You right. Know, he was in that 83 team, 84 team. You know, uh, right. it, it, it was who could play. We, you know, we recognized the talent and we weren't right. afraid to play them. And, and the one good thing, and this is where Spoonie comes in, at the freshman level, he throws the ball. Right. You know, not too many freshman teams, coaches, allow their kids to throw the ball that much. They might do it now. But back then, they didn't. And that's how we developed our quarterbacks. And when they came up to our level, that's all I, I concentrated on was the quarterback and wide receivers. Right. And we kept throwing. And we had to impress upon Coach McAllister that throwing the ball is not a bad thing. And, right. You know, he finally got it, when, like I said, when the Oz got there. You know, when I talked to Jack a little bit, he said he was shocked that he coached 19 years as a head coach. He said after the fourth year, he was so burned out. I mean, it's fun coaching, but... It does take a toll on you. Talk about, you know, how hard was it each year to come back as you got older? Did Was it tougher for you at times to want to keep coming back to it? Yeah, it, it got tougher as you got older. Um, but when we first started, God, we could, we wanted to do it year-round. And, you know, it was pretty – it was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, when it got uh, close to the – at the end of the 90s there, I always tell these guys, if I didn't run for mayor, Brockett would have never been here because Brockett right. took my he place. Right, replaced too, yeah. Yeah. And I said, uh, if I was still there, you know, we weren't. I don't think we would have been as successful, uh, you know, as they have been over the last twenty years. Right. Well, you know, I mean, Brackett's been awesome, but I think you're selling yourself short. I mean, you guys knew how to win, and you guys, you know, you definitely did. What, um, coach? Let me ask you: Were there some teams that necessarily didn't win a state title, but were some of your favorite teams? Like, you know, I always look at that. what team is it? The 85 team. I know they lost to Derby. They yeah. lost to Naugatuck. That was a very good team, though. You know, you had great players. I think Eddie Jerome and Andre Holman, you know, Coppola. Yeah. Were there any teams that stand yeah. out that may not have won a championship? Well, there, there's one team that did stand out, and that was, uh, I think it was 79, right after uh, Osheski and all those guys uh, right. uh, graduated. Um, we were going in, and everybody says, oh, you know, what's Ansonia going to do now because they don't have Sandy? They don't have, uh, you know, all the, the kids that uh, led them to the, those three state titles, 36 wins in a row. And we put a kid in, a quarterback, who only played – when he came out of his junior year, he was more of a baseball player, and that's Joey Potter. Oh, yes. Yep. We put him at quarterback. He was a good athlete. I didn't think he'd be that good at quarterback, but he – damn, he gave us the best year. I, I enjoyed that year more than any other year. Uh, and um, I remember we were undefeated going into Naugatuck. We ran an option, and the kid defensive end whacked uh, Joey, and you know his arm was hanging down. And of course, being the brilliant uh, offensive coordinator I was, I threw a pass to the next play. Right? <laughs> he couldn't even lift his arm, and I'm screaming at him, "Joey, throw the ball! Throw the ball!" And we called timeout. He had dislocated his shoulder. Oh wow! And uh, we had to bring one of the McNamara's in. Uh, I think it was uh, Timmy, uh, you know, to finish the game out. But that team. We went on to win a state title. Nobody expected us to do anything, and uh, I enjoyed that the most. And Joey went on to play quarterback at Brown and set all sorts right. of records. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, you find them by accident, yeah. and they end up doing great things but, for you. But I really enjoyed that year the most because, you know, we had a coach, and everybody said, well, you know, what are you going to do now? And that's what we did. Right. Now, you were obviously the offensive coordinator, but was there – particular position that you love to work with the most i mean was it the quarterback position that yeah, you that, 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 yeah i couldn't be bothered with anything else right you know jack and bobby did the line swoony uh you know he was with the freshman but when he came up he overlooked everything right uh but i, I just stayed with the quarterbacks and uh, the receivers even when we were running uh, scout teams I, I would be with the scout team because i like the offense much better right so, now yeah. now coach you left after 99 you became mayor of ansonia um did you go through like a rough period of missing coaching, even though you were running the city? I mean, was it tough those first few years? Yeah, it was. I, you know, I'd go to the games. Uh, I'd be on the sidelines, and I'm like, you know, do this, do that, and uh, you know, I wasn't able to have any input. And uh, 
Yeah, I did miss it right at the beginning, but now I'm I'm very content watching my two uh, sons coach. Right. My youngest son, like I mentioned earlier, he's a, an assistant baseball coach at West Haven. Right, Vince. Yep. Yeah, and he coaches uh, the high school girls basketball team in Ansonia. Right. So I, you know, I I got all three seasons covered. You know. Right. So who's got something to do? To now, do you give input to them, or only if they ask? No, you? only if they ask. Right. Only if they ask. I mean, there's sometimes I want to tell them. But I, I've been very quiet in regards to that. I let them uh, learn on their own because that's how I had to do it. Right. And I think what Duncan's done is wonderful because, I mean, a lot of times, you know, you want to coach where you went to high school at. And I'm sure he probably did at one point. But he wasn't afraid to kind of go out and, you know, find another school to coach because it's not easy. You know, when you coach at the school you went to, you have identity. People know who you are. Right. This school had no idea who he is. And I'm sure this school, I'm not trying to – disrespect the school but i doubt they ever heard of ansonia i mean you know well, it, there's a good chance they may not have no they, they did though because oh they did yeah, yeah. back in uh, 83 jack Coughlin, uh who's an all-stater here in ansonia right when it was coaching down in uh andrew ward it was called andrew ward back oh then. okay so jack was a head coach back then so there was an ansonia connection and, and I, I kid duncan because i said the last time they had a winning season was 1983 until he came along Wow. And you know, it's a long time. And, oh, you know, yeah. It, it, you can see in the community and, you know, the kids uh, how, you know, it, it affects you. You know, you got to, uh, you know, winning brings out a lot of good things. Right. But when you're losing constantly, you know, everybody's questioning and doubting what you're doing. But Duncan's built a real good program. He's very involved in the community, which I'm proud of. Right. He brings the kids out. uh you know, into the community, does a lot of uh, volunteer work, and uh, that's good. And, you know, he's got the program. He plays in the FCAC, which is a tough league. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, he's in the middle of the pack. You know, we wish he could get up a little higher, but, uh, you know, we're proud of what he's done. Right. And, um, you know, I think the thing, too, is, like I said, he's kind of – now he's kind of established that program. He's given it identity again, and it's his program. You know, yep. there's no mistake on that. Did he take any Ansonia guys with him, or is it strictly just him? No, it's just him. He, uh, right. he brought a couple guys from uh, New Canaan when he was on that staff. Right. And uh, he's starting to get an influx of uh, former players at Ward uh, to help him out, which is good. That's what they need. You know, see kids who have gone through the program and live in the community. Right. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we, you know, it's starting to turn around. Right. You know, Coach Derby went into the MVL probably close to 10 years now. It's almost 10 years. Seymour is in the MVL. Of course, you have Ansonia and Naugatuck. I've always said it would be so cool. It probably can't happen, but I'd always said that I'd love to see all the Valley schools be in one league. It'd be great. I mean, what do you think right now as far as the Valley? It, with football do you still think it's strong or i mean obviously derby hasn't been as successful and seymour's had some issues though they've had a couple of good years lately what do you see as far as valley football right now well I, I agree with you as far as some of the teams being down a little shelton's come up quite a bit right uh I, I, when i was uh way back when we would love to have seen an all valley league right uh, you know get amity in there also uh, we felt that was a, a good uh, that would have been a good fit for us. Right. And you know we didn't have to travel that much. I mean when I when I was in high school we played an independent league, uh, independent yes. schedule. You know we had Middletown. We traveled to Middletown, Stanford, right. West Haven. Yeah. Uh, you know. And yeah, there were no Kennedys or Watertowns no, back then. No, not at no. all. Right. You know we played everybody. Uh, you know we played uh, we played all the big teams back then. We were. Yeah, uh, you know, we were pretty successful. We were always successful. Ansonia football. And the one thing, one record I'm really proud of in Ansonia football is the overall wins. You know, we lead the state in overall wins. Right. And uh, I, I think that just shows continuity throughout the years. Right. But as far as Valley football, uh, you know, the spread has made it a lot easier for teams to uh, score a lot of points. There's right. not that much contact, you know, physicality uh, that there used to be. Uh, but uh, the Valley, uh, there's still tough football. It's still tough football. Right. And um, are you still able to catch an Ansonia game here and there? Yeah, or? I do. I, I yeah. try to catch the Ansonia Seymour Derby. or uh, Can't go to uh, Thanksgiving. I go to Ward. Lobo. Right. Right. And I was surprised at the crowds they get. You know, it's an inner oh, it's city. it's pretty good. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, like anything else, crowds are going to come if you're winning. If you're not winning, it's going to be harder, you know. I will say, though, it is kind of – sometimes it's depressing to see when you see Ansonia Derby play. 
and you could go to Jarvis Field and you could park inside that parking lot because that was never the case. Do you think Friday nights hurt that rivalry at all? Or do you yeah, just... I, do. I, I wish they'd go back and play some afternoon games. Uh, I, right. I see down where Duncan is. Uh, they play some afternoon, Saturday afternoon games or Saturday morning games, and they get bigger crowds than they would have on a Friday night. But I agree with you, Mike. Uh, I, I think the Friday nights really hurt. Right. At first, there was a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. You know, we're playing under the lights. But as time went on, you know, the seniors, they don't come out. Um, you know, it gets colder a lot quicker. Right. You know, if, and why do you want to go watch a 56-6 game? Right. You know, you, you know it's going to be over at halftime. So you just pick and choose as to when you do go to games. And uh, it's a lot different now than it was back then. Right. You know, that rivalry was one of the best, probably the best in the state. I'm being biased on, you know, obviously. One thing I really thought was cool, though, as much as Derby and Ansonia both hated each other, you you as coaches had a great relationship with their coaches. You, I think you guys are real good friends with Charlie Desenzo, John D., you know, Frankie Alu. So, I mean, yeah. that respect was always there. I think you both wanted to beat each other, but you both – you know, respected how good each program was. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, Jack and I played with Charlie and John D. For Kasdan. For Kasdan. Yeah. And, and, you know, we'd play 130 games during the summer. Not once would we bring up the Derby Ansonia football game. No. Was, but the week of the Ansonia Derby football game, we wouldn't talk to each other. We couldn't stand each other. Right. We'd bring everything out that was bad between each other. And then once the game was over, we hugged each other, and that was it. We'd wait for another year. Right, but uh, yeah, we had a, we had, and we had a lot of fun, you know, uh, being together. That, right, that was the best part, you know, and uh, we've respected. And uh, one other thing I like to add, you know, Paul Spineheimer, he played with us, yes, too, yeah. you know, and uh, good friends with him. He just had open heart surgery this week. Oh, did he? I didn't yeah. even know. How's he yeah, doing? He's doing well. recovering. Yeah, okay, glad to hear that. And uh, my best wishes go out to him and his family. Wow, I did not even know that. Yeah, yeah. and I believe. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. You were his best man in his wedding, correct? Yeah, I right. was his best man, and uh, uh, he was his, Jack's best man in Jack's wedding. Wow, yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, and that all goes back to us playing together, you know, playing softball. Right. You know, Coach, you were one of the things you and Jack did in the early 90s, which everybody liked, was you guys started that driving range over by McDonald's <laughs> over there. And that was a great thing. People would go up there and uh, go off. So you and Jack, I mean, you guys were always like – not just football coaches. You guys had a wonderful friendship as well. Yeah, we did. We, we had a great time. Uh, it had to be the worst driving range in the state. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we had to go out and pick it up by hand every night. Right. Uh, we didn't have a, a, a machine that would pick it up, and it was a rough terrain because it used to be the old uh, drive-in down there before um, yeah. BJ's went in there. Is it BJ? Yeah, BJ's. Right. That went in there, and uh, we'd be out there every night trying to pick it up by hand. And then, you know, guys were always hitting the balls, and we, we lost a lot of balls in the river. Right. So, uh, yeah, that was a— Yeah, you'd always—I uh, just always remember, you'd always see Jack up there in the summer. He was always yeah. up there, you know. And I think, like, that was the thing, too. You guys did it more as a hobby. It was for fun where you could go and shoot, yeah, you and, know, some golf balls and stuff right. like that. And Jack was a very good golfer for his size. Right. You know, it's hard to believe, but uh, he, he could hit a ball. And, uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that. And, uh, you know, we, when we were younger, we worked together. So, you know, we were always together. Yeah, quite you a know, bit. it's funny. I tell this story a lot. Being from Derby, I would only see Jack game day coaching. And, you know, he was a rough coach, so I'd always think, you know, he's this mean guy. And, you know, I didn't like Aunt Sonia, so I didn't like Jack. But I'll tell you, when I got to meet him, what a great guy he was. Like, my whole opinion of him changed. That As the person, he is. He was one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet. Yeah, yeah, we referred to him as the gentle giant. Right. But uh, there were quite a few times he bailed me out. <clears throat> In high school, we were, we were playing Shelton in basketball, and um, there was a, a fight broke out at the end of the game. And uh, this kid had me on the ground, and he was ready to tattoo me, and Jack came out of nowhere and decked him, uh, you know. <laughs> and the next day, they said somebody had a silver dollar in their hand and busted the kid's, uh, you know, uh, eye open or something. But right. it was Jack. And, you know, Jack was that type of guy. Uh, he's, he was calm until you got him going. Once you got him going, watch out. That was it, yeah. Yep, but a great guy, you know. We certainly miss him. Definitely. Um, another guy you mentioned earlier is uh, Bubba Green, and – you know, I think most people that were around Ansonia know what he meant to Ansonia, but I don't think people today realize the impact he had on Ansonia. Having that KO club for those kids was one of the best things those kids could have. And, you know, that guy just loved Ansonia. 
Yeah. It was a great place. I mean, that's where the kids can go. Uh, you know, if they had no place to uh, eat, Bubba would uh, cook some fried chicken for him. And every right. su- I know every Sunday night he ate baked a turkey because I was up. To, I was one of the first ones up there right. to get that. <laughs> but uh, you know, all the kids would congregate there. You know, they learned how to play cards. Uh, we and you guys would table. watch film there, correct? Yeah, you yeah. Know, we watch film there. Uh, we built an in, in, uh, indoor swimming pool. We had a sauna. Right. We had a whirlpool. We had ping pong tables. Everything was there for him. We had weightlifting in the cellar. And I was one of the, uh, one of the original uh, KO Club boys. So, uh, you know, I remember it just growing from a house being in the cellar to the whole house being ours. And we just added on it all the time. Right. And, I mean, he would also tape every game for you guys. I mean, back in the days where, you know, you had to do it with the real the real, he did it. And he did a phenomenal job. I mean, all those games that they have online – that was done by him. I mean, he really just was all about these kids and these coaches. Yeah, he did it for nothing. I mean, it was, it was his love of uh, the Ansonia kids. I mean, you know, he grew up here, and he uh, uh, he felt invested in uh, our program. And, uh, uh, you know, he did such a great job. It was just such a great place. It, add, it added to the aura of Ansonia football. Right. You know, it was a great place for our kids to go. I mean, we, you know, we're, where's – you wanted to know where somebody was, you call the Kale Club, and he was there. Right. You know, and it was just, uh, it was it was the right place at the right time. Could it happen nowadays? I don't think so. Right. What was the biggest thing you got out of coaching? I mean, you want, you were part of 12 championships, which is tremendous, but what was the thing that was most enjoyable for you? The most enjoyable was my friendship with Spoonie and Bobby and Jack and, and Coach Mack. Right. You know, I enjoyed that the most. Uh you know, being with them all the time. It wasn't just during the football season either. You know, I played right. basketball with Spoonie, softball with Jack. Uh, you know, so we were always together. We'd always go watch our kids who played. Uh, you know, if we had time off, we'd go watch them play in college. And, you know, we'd go all over and together and just have a great time. We were always laughing, joking around. You know, it was just a, a great time, you know. And that's why I enjoyed the most. Right. Now, let me ask you, now that you got a lot of – you know, more free time on your hands. Will Jim Del Volpe ever make a comeback coaching, or are you done? No, I'm done. Yeah, so. Yeah, I, I, I did what I had to do. You know, not only did I coach uh, basketball, but I coached baseball and uh, uh, basketball on the freshman level right. for many years, and then I officiated uh, both sports, basketball and baseball. Uh, I was out quite a bit during, uh, you know, during the time. I want to thank my wife, Jane, for putting up with me for all those years. Right. Um, you know, but uh, I, I, I put a lot of time in on the fields uh, around the valley, and, uh, you know, I, I've had it. I, I really enjoy going to watch my uh, my son's right. uh, coach and my grandson, who's now playing uh, baseball down in Fairfield. Now, do you miss it anymore, or is that done, like, as far as well, missing I, I, it? Yeah, of course. I You know, I, yeah. I feel as though I have the answers, you know. Right. Mean, that's why I ran for mayor at the time. I thought I had all the answers then, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're mayor for 14 years. You did something right. Yeah, but you know? I didn't have all the answers. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I'm done. You know, I, I enjoy it watching. Right. Well, you know, Coach, I mean, a guy that's from Derby, I mean, I saw how successful this program was for many years. Still going strong today. They've won 20 championships. You know, as far as MVL titles, I'm sure they've won more than 20. And the job that you, Jack, Bill, Bobby, John, Earl, all these guys did as Steve Pepler, you know, and if I'm missing any, Kevin Rowley. Yeah. I mean, what you guys did as coaches was tremendous because, you know, again, you guys have families, you have full-time jobs, and this is really a part-time job that becomes a full-time job. And I really do applaud you for what you did for all these years of coaching Ansonia football, and I really do appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate it, Mike. Uh, you know, really, like I said, I really enjoyed it, and uh, it was a – you know, everybody asks you, "What do you do?" And I says, "Well, I coach high school football." Right. And I said, "Well, how do you make any, you know, do you make a lot of money doing that?" I says, "No, but that's what I enjoy the most." And I think that's what Jack, Bobby, and Spoonie would say also. Right. Well, again, uh, I thank you for coming uh, on today. It was a lot of fun. It was an honor for me. So, thank you again, uh, Mike. Thank you for having me on, and you're doing a great, you know, great job with this program. Thank you, Coach. Okay. And that was the legendary Jimmy Del Volpe. I'm Mike Canici for Valley Sports Rewind, saying goodbye, everyone. Uh,